This guy wore his device for two weeks, no change. And he sat down and said, oh, I'm still getting headaches. I said, now, we went through the whole thing. Same number of headaches per week, same intensity. So I colored it all in with a, mark, so with a Sharpie, and there's two little dings, one there and one right there. I know that guy ne has never gone anywhere. He just squeezes and holds still. And he comes back, and there's just this, this two dings in it. And I say dings because in Southern California, a pressure ding on your surfboard is a badge of honor. Here's how you get one. You're on your surfboard. You're standing there. I don't surf. My brother does because he used to show me his pressure dings. You're on your surfboard. When the wave comes from above and hits you hard, it drives your heels into the fiberglass and will make dents in your fiberglass from your heels driven into your surfboard. That is a badge of honor because you were clobbered. <laughs> if there are pressure dings in acrylic, you have to squeeze really hard and barely move as you're squeezing. It's amazing to make pressure dings in an NTI device. That is a clencher extraordinaire. So I start stacking tongue blades to increase vertical dimension across that discluding element. And when I get to the tongue blade that when you buy it, you guys go, oh, that's weird. I take that one out. I'm back to the, the third one bothered him. The, I, he bit on two? That's fine. Doesn't hurt at all. Okay. How do I translate that to back to the discluding element? I just stack up. I, I drew a lot. Well, I've already got that black on there, you know. I've stacked up acrylic, same thickness as my tongue blades. Now that's kind of a weird, oh, that's too much vertical dimension. No, it's not. He squeezes on that thing with less intensity than he could here. As you open them up a little bit, you reduce the efficiency of the system and they clench with less intensity. I'm trying to decrease intensity of muscle contraction. Here's the way to do it. And now that, and the other way you might diagnose the need for this, when they sit down and say, I'm still having headaches, you never ask, well, how bad are they now? You've got two numbers in your chart. The number of mornings they woke up with is zero, and the average number that they have upon waking with, when they have a number. So I say to them instead, I don't respond to that. I'm still having a headache thing. I don't take the bait on that. How many mornings a week do you wake up with a zero? Well, two. It's like it was before. Well, what's the average number you have now when you wake up? That's about a three or four. Well, it used to be a five or a six. He doesn't recall that, but it's a very accurate report from him. It's the visual analog scale, but it's verbal analog scale. He, may, he says three or four, still having headaches. God damn it, I spent 500 bucks. There used to be fives or sixes. I've turned the volume down on the intensity. That's my assumption. That's the guy that I'll increase vertical on. It's, see, I never error to the side of he might be a primary clencher, so I'm going to increase vertical as much as I dare. You have to start at minimal because you can't do any harm. You're not supposed to make him worse before you get him better. You have to sneak towards that. And I tell the patient that. I say, we may, I say what if this doesn't, they'll ask, well, what if it doesn't work? What if I'm still getting headaches? Well, I may end up making the device bigger than it is right now. But I can't do that now because what if you go here, I'll make you worse. I have to sneak up on that one. They like that you've got a plan. So whenever we talk about increasing vertical, we're zeroing back in on the world of occluding and teeth touching things. When I talk about increased vertical, I'm always imagining a condyle rotated out of its fossa in an excursive clench. To me, they're the same thing. If you're going to increase, here's, here's the device with minimal posterior disclusion a primary clencher. How come three sticks on that one guy was one stick too many? So you start to practice and you elevate this thing, make it a little bigger. We're only rotating here. Pretty soon this thing is, has to back up. It's going to rotate that way. You're going to hit a limit. Let's make it a little bigger. Oh, we're getting close. Well, does that hurt to clench? No, it's okay. Here's another. Ah. Back up too much. That's how I determine how, how much vertical can I add. Now, I get creeped out, too. I, I, I might not make it as big as I think I can. I'm going to reserve that for maybe later. 
Here's the typical delivery. When I have them protrude, retrude, sometimes this discluding element, which is really designed for an excessive overlap, overjet's not necessary. I'll end up lopping off most of it, some of it. And here's protrusion, that discluding element, I've ramped it down in the back. It's not unusual to have these things with the 50 degree slope. Not unusual at all. If this discluding element was parallel with this and came straight back, this mandible would be more would be more opened. It'd be more rotated open. <laughs> now, is this an excessive vertical dimension? Looks kind of creepy to me. And that person squeezes really hard, it didn't hurt them at all. I think the practitioner that provided this must have assumed that that's how it came from the lab, therefore that's okay. So he's still responsible for going through the motions on this device. And these are devices that the patient brings with them to the neurology clinic. All right, go sideways. So they're having problems. Yeah. And I think it's because this gal can clench on her canine effortlessly. Let's go the other way. No wonder her face still hurt. Because when she would do, see, when I see a flat canine, how in the world do you get a flat canine? You have to rehearse in a sideways clench. And when you release the resistance of moving sideways, you'll keep on going until the other canine finds its target. So here's what I made on that visit. Here's her lower device. Now this still looks like it's a vertical opening. Maybe you could make it smaller. But when I moved her side to side and she squeezed really hard, it didn't bother her at all. Matter of fact, she goes, well, that feels a lot more comfortable than the other device. So I, I like the sound of that. Sometimes when it's, I can, if, when it's irregular, I can hold on to the upper, the outer shell and dip the ex in, the, in the shallow hot water. Put it back in, you sort of border mold it like, bleh, bleh, and it's perfect. So Kirk Blanchard pointed out to me a while back, hey, this upside down discluding element sometimes grabs a central like that and it gets stuck and it can't get back the other way. There's resistance to lateral movements. We should make this thing more of a tangent, more of an upside of a table. I call Kirk, he used to be Captain Kirk Blanchard, now he's Admiral Kirk, so we call it the Admiral's Table. Here's that device kind of scratched up. So before new devices were produced that had the Admiral's Table prefabricated on it, I would started filling in these sides with acrylic on the devices I had in the drawer. And now I get, now we'll show it in a sec, that canine's not touching, it's just, the, it's just the perspective, there's the canine not touching it. This guy could have perpetual joint problems. And you'd say, well how could that be unless you tell him to go over and do something weird, because you can't, people don't make their joint hurt in the chair, they wait till later when you're not looking. 